Hey guys, I hope you're well and welcome back to my new series. In this series I'll be looking at different positional concepts and showing you how to effectively apply them into your own games. The first one we'll look at has to do with mastering the bishop pair, so sit back and enjoy the show. So the following game was played between Vladimir Kremnik with the black pieces and Gada Kamsky with white in the Monte Carlo of 1996. In the following position after queen trade on b8, Kamsky opted for bishop takes f6, g takes f6 and he played knight to e4, most likely expecting the response bishop to e7 to defend the pawn, after which white would have responded knight to d6 check. And if bishop takes, rook takes, white has a great advantage here because of the pawn structure and he got rid of the bishop pair, and if the black king goes to f8, white would have taken on f7 and then capture on d7. However, Kramnik didn't do this. He understood that the bishop pair was very strong and simply allowed the capture on f6 by playing the move bishop to c6. White takes an f6, king to e7 was played, knight h5, and then Kramnik just plays the move rook to g8, the plan being rook to g5, get rid of this knight, which is preventing our dark squared bishop from developing. We're also putting pressure on this g2 pawn with our bishop and rook, which provokes pawn to f3, rook to g5 is played, knight to f4, and now Kremnik plays the move pawn to h5. So because he has the bishop pair, he wants to bring the bishops to the most active squares and active diagonals he possibly can. Um, this way he's going to get a lot of compensation for the two bishops and sacrifice pawn. Pawn goes to h4, rook goes to e5, knight goes to d3, bishop comes out check, king b1, rook goes to e3. This is preventing the bishop on f1 from developing, so all of white's pieces are somewhat tied down and development is very difficult to finish. The rook goes to e1, black plays rook to g8, White manages to trade off a pair of rooks. c3 was played. Here Kramnik plays f5. The idea is that he wants to bring his king up, and now he has this potential pass pawn in the center. King to c2, king f6, rook h3. And now he fixes the white pawn structure and keeps the bishop on e3. White was perhaps hinting at the idea of f4, attacking the bishop and creating a square on e5 for the knight. This way we don't allow the knight to get into the game. And notice that we're using the bishop which our opponent does not have very very effectively. This dark squared bishop is limiting the scope of this knight on d3 from getting into the game. King d1 was played, e5, so we're using our pawns in the center now. The bishops are very very good when supporting pass pawns and when pushing pawns. King e2, bishop goes to d7, attacking the rook. So now we're going to rescope the bishop to a different diagonal where it's going to serve a better purpose. Rook h1, bishop goes to f5, king d1, rook comes to d8. White is very short on moves here. That's why he's just shuffling his pieces around and he can't move the bishop at all from the f1 square. King goes to c2, but now he walks into a pin, but there's no other way for him to do defend this knight on d3. And now Kramnik takes the opportunity to play the move pawn to e4. So what this does is it simplifies the pawn but it also brings the bishop to a more active square where it's putting pressure on the g2 pawn. So after the capture, white plays pawn to b3. Notice that this bishop is doing an excellent job of cutting into the position on both sides and this bishop is pinning this knight to the king and it's very hard for white to unpin himself. There's just a lot of pressure on all white's weak points. a5 is played. a3 and here black opens up the position on the queen side. So when you have the bishop pair, it's very important that you play on both sides of the board because one of the advantages of the bishops is that it can support the pawns from a long distance. Here with the knight pinned and out of play, we need to open some lines. The king side is completely tied up, so it makes sense to open lines on the queen side. Black plays the move pawn to b4. 
pawn takes b4, pawn takes b4, c takes, and black plays rook c8 check. King goes across, bishop d4. The bishops are defending a lot of the squares in the center. King to b1, walks into another pin. The rook goes to a8, threatening to bring the rook across to the back rank. Rook check. King d2, rook a2 was played. King to c1. We're not interested in taking this pawn. Instead, Kremnik goes for the outright win. He goes bishop to e3 check. King b1. Rook to d2, hitting the knight, which now can't be defended. Pawn to b5, and here Kramnik can of course take the knight, and it's a winning position because it will be a piece up, but it's important that you don't allow any counterplay if you can, and go for the most accurate win here. Instead of just winning the piece, um, Kramnik goes for a position where he doesn't allow white any counterplay. So first he checks. He checks again on c1. Because of this pin again on the knight on d3, white can't take it, so it has to go king b2, and now Kramnik takes on d3, utilizing the pin on the back rank and winning a knight for free, but at the same time not allowing any counter chances at all. Pawn goes to b6, so we can't take it because the rook is under attack. Instead, Kramnik takes here on f1. The pawn pushes, but it can be easily stopped at any time by dropping the bishop back. Kramnik checks and then drops the bishop back to e5. The following was a great example by Vladimir on how to utilize the bishop pair. I hope you enjoyed this video and learned something from it, and I look forward to seeing you in the next part of our series. Take care.